we were at a company about five months ago that was interested in buying our product. And uh, we talked to them for a while, and they said, this is going to be great fun. We've been in the business for two years. We have a lot of fun doing it, and we're in it for the fun. And we're in it for the fun, too, but we're in it really for the money. Video game executives. What makes them tick? The games industry has a long and hallowed history of people in major positions of power saying dumb things. It's been well documented and well remembered. If anything, it's kind of a tradition. Right. So stick with 360, that's your message if you don't, well, you don't like it? Well, if, if you have zero access yeah. to the internet, that is an offline <laughs> device. Today, I want to focus on three people, each an executive at a AAA game company, and discuss something that they've said or an opinion they have. For whatever reason, these are things that have really bothered me, sometimes for years, and I kind of want to unpack and discuss why it bothers me. Before we get going, though, I think it's important to lay down a few disclaimers. Disclaimer 1. Executives have said and done worse things. The stories we're going to talk about today I didn't choose because I thought they were the most important or deserved the most attention. There are plenty of examples of executives whose actions extend far beyond the realm of video games. Jim Ryan's bizarre comments on reproductive rights, Bobby Kotick, and everything he's ever done. The fact that years after Ubisoft's toxic culture was exposed, Yves Jamont has still yet to apologize for or really even acknowledge any personal responsibility he had in that culture. All these problems are problems that are bigger than just video games, but we're not going to discuss them today. Disclaimer 2. Companies are not monoliths. The large corporations we all know and play games from are not led by a single individual. I mean, you've got CEOs, sure, but also a board of directors, shareholders, and other executives and high-level managers that all contribute to decision making. One executive's opinion is just one person's opinion, and a lot of the industry's problems from crunch to monetization to workplace toxicity are systemic, and they aren't the fault of a single individual, and they also can't be solved by a single individual. And just because these people have said and done stupid things, whether we talk about them today or not, it doesn't make them bad people. At least, most of them. Okay, so to begin, Chris Bruzo and loot boxes. In October 2021, Eurogamer's Wesley Yinpool interviewed EA's chief experience officer Chris Bruzo. It's one of the most fascinating and revealing interviews with a game executive I think I've ever read. It's also a really good piece of journalism and a showcase of Yenpool's skills as an interviewer. For Bruzo, it's a showcase of his ability to disingenuously and pompously defend unpopular and predatory monetization. The discussion revolves around loot boxes, more specifically whether or not they constitute gambling, whether or not FIFA 22's ultimate team could be considered pay to win, and why EA's sports titles like FIFA, Madden, and NHL contain loot boxes with gameplay affecting items when other titles don't. Bad arguments in favor of skeevy monetization are not a new thing. Just look at the most downvoted comment in the history of Reddit. Loot boxes, though, are a bit of a different animal. Their resemblance to straight gambling and prevalence in games for all ages sets them apart from other forms of monetization. Loot boxes may not hit headlines today as much as they did a few years ago, but they're still a lucrative business for EA, which made $1.62 billion off of FIFA, Madden, and NHL's Ultimate teams during fiscal year 2021. Interestingly, in their latest report, EA didn't mention how much money Ultimate Team brought in, but regardless. For its Ultimate Team mode, loot boxes include items like new players that affect gameplay, meaning the more you buy, the better chance you have at gaining an advantage. During the interview, Bruzo makes a handful of lazy, bad faith answers, pivoting from excuse to excuse in an effort to both sidestep the truth, which is that Ultimate Team is pay to win, and distract from the bigger question. If FIFA, and by extension EA's other sports titles, has to be monetized this way. When asked why FIFA has loot boxes in the first place, Bruzo says, We want to strengthen the connection between the real world sport and the game. That whole gamification of what it means to have a different roster of players coming from different backgrounds with scarcity. We have created these things over a long period of time to actually mirror what it feels like. The tough strategic choices you have to make when you're putting a squad together that works uniquely as that squad you want to manage, that you want to play with. What Bruzo is doing here is equating FIFA's ultimate team loot boxes to the real-world economics of professional sports, saying that real-world transactions, as well as ultimate team's pay-to-win nature, are a realistic aspect of the sport that the game captures. 
The problem with it, and the point with the loot boxes, is you're buying gameplay affecting items. Your loot box contains players you use to play in a competitive multiplayer mode. Or you can do that, right? Just like real world football. It's clearly a ludicrous argument for multiple reasons, some of which Yumpool points out immediately after. What Bruzo seems to forget, and really more likely he consciously chooses to ignore, is that it's not uncommon for a game to simulate the real-world economics of sports without any real-world transactions. You can create a professional sports game and have scarcity and make it difficult to sign players to contracts or deal with a salary cap, all without any additional cost past the product's entry point. This exists today in various forms and fashions, whether we're talking about video games or fantasy leagues. This past summer, I ran the Yankees into the ground by trading not only for Manny Machado, but Juan Soto, and the results were great. For, I mean, for my digital Yankees. Throughout the interview, Bruzel falls back on five distinct arguments, sometimes denying that Ultimate Team is pay to win, and other times excusing that it's pay to win. Intellectual dishonesty and corporate propaganda at its finest. Of course, the real reason that FIFA and EA's other sports titles include predatory and pervasive monetization is because it makes the company money. I think at least partly why EA, along with 2K, has largely gotten away with over-monetizing and ruining an entire genre of games is because sports games have fairly large casual audiences. Audiences that don't see the erosion of video games due to microtransactions and service-based design because they don't play a ton of video games or closely follow the industry. They do other things like have fulfilling social lives and go jogging. That's a market you can take advantage of and actively sell less of a product to, which is what is happening and has been happening for more than a decade. Not to say that that same erosion hasn't happened across games. I think it definitely has, but sports games are at a higher degree of severity. It's important to note here that the industry knows monetization and loot boxes are unpopular. Sometimes it's part of a game's marketing. People like Bruzo do not work to innovate or to make good games. They work to maintain the status quo, willing to say whatever it is that needs to be said in order to avoid the fact that EA just doesn't really care about the integrity of its product or the integrity of its industry at least as much as they love the money that loot boxes from Ultimate Team brings in. And that is all besides the larger issue of loot boxes as a mechanic that prey on people who may struggle with gambling addictions. One of Bruzo's answers that made headlines was that children shouldn't be spending money in FIFA, and I think he personally believes that, but children aren't the only people that struggle with gambling addiction. Bruzo talks about all the things that EA is doing to rein in uncontrolled spending and increase transparency, but if EA were really desperate enough to stop all these things, you'd think they have the power to do it. The fact is, many of the problems caused by loot boxes and FIFA Ultimate Team could be stopped by severing their connection to real-world money. But for EA, that would just be too costly. EA has and will continue to work tirelessly, diligently on cures to the side effects of a problem they created while making sure that the root of that problem persists. One thing we probably should say is that if EA and the rest of the industry overnight had a change of heart, it probably would be difficult to transition away from this era of pervasive monetization, if not only for the fact that it now represents a huge portion of the industry. Video games have evolved a lot in the last 10 years, and one of the most important evolutions is that games can be played over a much longer period of time. Developers, they don't get to launch a game and then take a vacation for 30 days the way it used to be. Now you launch the game and then you start. You continue to develop that game. That means all those wonderful people who care very much about football, they have to keep on working and they love it. And that takes resources. It just does. So if we're delivering great value, and apparently we are because 100 million people are playing the game, it can generate significant revenues. And we need those revenues in order to continue to pay our developers so they can continue to make more value and make the game more fun over time. I don't see that changing. In totality, this quote is one big pile of shit. Bruzo is speaking within the context of EA here, but even if it is true that developers have no choice but to continue working on a game without a break after it launches, the only reason that is reality is because companies like 
Electronic Arts, Ubisoft, Activision, Blizzard, and 2K made that the reality. But there is a grain of truth here. Sure, video games, at least at the AAA level, are making more money than they ever have, and a large slice of that is microtransactions, loot boxes, and monetization schemes with long tails. Scaling expectations for growth and revenue down from where they are now is, I'd assume, extremely complicated economically and probably an impossible pitch to investors. In fact, I think it may be somewhat naive just entertaining the idea. Moving on, Strauss Selnick and Cowboys. In a September 2020 interview with Protocol, Take-Two CEO Strauss Selnick says something that's always kind of bothered me, but we're going to need some clarification. When discussing systematizing quality of content, Zelnick says, You can systemize quality, but you can't systemize hit creation. So what does make hits if quality isn't enough? The biggest hits are typically the ones you never expected. At the same time, at Take Two, before the launch of the first Red Dead Redemption, the perception was Western-themed video games always fail because the only one anyone had ever heard of was called Gun, and it failed. Of course, everyone was worried about it. Rockstar Games brought out Red Dead, and it was a massive hit. So if you can take the baseline of quality, and then you can encourage your creative teams to pursue their passions, truly to pursue their passions wherever those passions lead them, that seems to be the recipe for generating a disproportionate share of hits. This is actually a point Zelnick has made repeatedly. Here he is again in 2018. You mentioned uh, in the call that Westerns tend to, people don't think Westerns are that good. What's the secret here? Uh, well, conventional wisdom before we launched Red Dead Redemption was that Westerns don't work in video right. games. That's no longer conventional wisdom because Red Dead Redemption was a huge hit. Okay, so this philosophy of Zelnick's is layered. Setting a standard of quality and allowing your creative teams to pursue their passions is great. I think that's a philosophy most would find pretty agreeable. But we're also talking about take two. It's easy to claim that you believe in something like pushing your creatives to truly pursue their passions when Rockstar Games is one of your subsidiaries. Elsewhere, Take-Two is a pretty typical AAA publisher. NBA 2K is, year by year, one of the most egregiously monetized games on the market. Grand Theft Auto V, more specifically GTA Online, is one of the most profitable video games of all time. Exactly why and how it's been so successful is a complex answer, but the substance of its profit generation is largely vapid microtransactions. In early 2022, Take-Two acquired mobile developer Zynga for a cool $12.7 billion. Zynga's entire business model, of course, also being vapid microtransactions. I know this is somewhat petty, and Zelnick probably actually believes in the things that he says he believes in, but Take-Two is not special because they allow Rockstar Games to be Rockstar Games. But besides all that, it's always really bothered me that the American West was once viewed as too much of a risk to theme or set a video game in. I mean, this is an ancient history, Red Dead Redemption released in 2010. Westerns are a major set piece in American mythology, and with the genre's revision in the late 60s and the early 70s, they're also a great vehicle for critically examining American mythmaking and the history of how the country itself came to be. To some extent, this is what the first and second Red Dead do. But the Old West isn't just an American fascination, it's a global one. Arguably the most famous Western song of all time came from an Italian movie. To be fair, Zelnick isn't necessarily saying he agreed with that sentiment at the time, that westerns were risky, so maybe we should amend the title of this portion of the video to something to... Video game executives are a bunch of silly gooses, except kind of for Strauss Zelnick because I agree with him, but I really dislike the AAA risk aversion his comments point out, though we don't know if he agreed with that sentiment at the time. Some companies still know how business is done. Outside of Zelnick, there are plenty of examples of risk aversion we can trace through history. EA, once again and famously, comes to mind, with former President Frank Gabo and former CFO Blake Jorgensen speaking at different times about linear, single-player experiences as though they are economically untenable. Serge Haskoway, Ubisoft's former chief creative officer, once cancelled a planned King Arthur game saying it needed to be better than Tolkien, and didn't want Assassin's Creed to have a female protagonist for fear that female protagonists don't sell. And as ridiculous as those decisions are, they pale in comparison to the reason that Surge is Ubisoft's former chief creative officer. There's a relevant phrase here I'm sure you're probably familiar with. 
that the AAA industry lacks innovation. It's a loaded phrase that spurs all kinds of debate. Relevant to us though, I do think at least parts of the AAA industry lack innovation. And while the variety of games and genres released over the last half decade or so has increased, it's also an industry that holds itself back. The proliferation of service-based gaming and the importance of player retention have left once well-stocked genres whittled away or heavily altered to fit that paradigm. Today, AAA tactical military shooters are almost non-existent. Until a few years ago, AAA horror was pretty limited. To make the kind of numbers the industry is currently making, a more diverse catalog of games that serve smaller markets and take more creative risks is impossible, at least within the context of its own self-imposed economic goals. But even then, mass market appeal is consistently underestimated. Elden Ring is a cryptic, difficult, and damn good medieval RPG that goes against so much of what the market would deem as safe, and it has sold incredibly well. Before this teaser for Cyberpunk 2077, Cyberpunk as a genre existed, but with nowhere near the ubiquity it does today. Since that teaser, the genre has become saturated, and that's great. Tomorrow, if some AAA developer will say, Sucker Punch, announced they were making an open-world steampunk RPG where you managed trains or something, I don't, I don't know anything about uh, steampunk, but the point is, uh, something different and weird like that, I think people would be really excited for it, including myself. There are definitely exceptions to this. The AAA industry is nowhere near devoid of creativity, and if you wanted to make a counter-argument that said things were actually getting better the past few years, you could probably make a pretty good argument. Deathloop is a great first-person roguelike with excellent progression, unique arc direction, and a great story, and it is a pretty unconventional shooter. Death Stranding, as self-indulgent and out of control as it was, I really enjoyed simply because it was unlike anything I've ever played, and it was backed up by a budget that afforded phenomenal visuals, a phenomenal cast, and phenomenal performances. Neither of those games fit the AAA mass market mold. Still, it's disappointing that what we collectively consider to be the most well-funded and capable sector of game development is stuck working on games that don't fully take advantage of its resources, have features like forced online integration shoved into the design, or are in one way or another heavily weighed down by service-based monetization. On the flip side, this has allowed spaces that the AAA industry neglects to be filled by smaller developers who are absolutely killing it. Entire genres are going through a renaissance right now, fueled almost entirely by smaller developers with smaller economic goals, but lots of passion and talent. Point is, Zelnik's quote is indicative of, and an admission of this problem. Games could be more diverse than they are now at the AAA level. The industry puts so much pressure on market appeal and trend chasing that aversion to anything that isn't deemed safe, while not so massive to eclipse all games, is definitely widespread enough that it hurts the medium. Our final study, Yosuke Matsuda and The Chain. In their 2022 annual report, Square Enix CEO Yosuke Matsuda told investors of the company's desire to diversify the capital structure of their studios, by which he meant not fixating on full ownership and instead making various patterns of the studio's capital structure that enable sharing development risk with partners. Such a strategy would allow us to grow our studio portfolio as a whole while exposing ourselves to less risk. Specifically, we would diversify the capital structure of our studios by not only owning some studios outright, but also by welcoming third parties to take stakes in some of our studios or by our taking stakes in studios outside the group. The last decade or so for Square Enix and their ex-Western studios has been strange. From a quality standpoint, the games were relatively solid, even if their returns weren't good enough for Square Enix's famously stingy expectations. From a business standpoint, things weren't as smooth. Hitman's forced online connectivity and a la carte release strategy, Deus Ex Mankind Divided's crowdfunding-like approach to pre-orders, and Avengers, well, entire existence, were all met with confusion, skepticism, and unpopularity, and rightfully so. Since then, IO Interactive eloped with the Hitman license, and Square Enix sold Eidos Montreal, Crystal Dynamics, and the now closed Square Enix Montreal to Embracer Group for $300 million and free shipping. Perhaps one way to read Square Enix's last few years of controversies, at least within the context of their Western studios, is to see it all as a company chasing trends and attempting to ease development costs. I guess in some ways you could argue that's anything any company does, but I'm not sure any company has the same combination of 
widely unpopular business decisions mixed with a generally positive reaction to their games. But enough about the past. For Matsuda and Square Enix, what would sharing development risk with partners look like? Well, enter non-fungible tokens. Square Enix has narrowed its relationship with NFTs and blockchain gaming, perhaps more than any other AAA game company, maybe outside Ubisoft, and has done so while cutting away talented teams known for generally good games. 2022 was not the first year Square Enix nor Matsuda has mentioned blockchain gaming and NFTs, but it definitely seems like the first year the company started to give them a serious look. Beginning with Matsuda's New Year's letter to investors where he spoke about blockchain gaming as a self-sustaining development strategy and bemoaned the fact that traditional gaming offered no real incentive for user-generated content outside of volunteer spirit and goodwill. I think I'm safe in assuming that Matsuda's words were universally mocked, maybe outside a few obnoxious Discord servers. Now, how important NFTs and blockchain gaming are going to be to Square Enix moving forward is debatable, and we don't know. But what we've seen with Square Enix over the last decade-ish is a company willing to experiment with and try different release strategies and monetization schemes. In that 2022 annual report, not only did Matsuda speak on diversifying Square Enix's capital structure, but also stated that the Japanese market was no longer lucrative enough to recoup development costs, and called blockchain entertainment a key part of the company's future growth. I don't think it's unreasonable to extrapolate from all this that Square Enix may attempt some serious blockchain integration. Maybe not the integration of an entire AAA release, but something definitely more substantial than action figures. Reading about blockchain gaming and NFTs and play-to-earn games is existentially terrifying. It's a completely different paradigm with different goals. Priorities in that space are closer to that of a casino of gambling. Turning digital objects locked into a video game into real-world assets worth real-world money by way of fungible and non-fungible tokens. Now, digital goods already exist. Scarce digital goods already exist as do the highly immoral unofficial and official channels where those digital goods are bought, sold, and gambled. Look no further than Roblox, CSGO, and FIFA. And as an aside, you'd think proponents of Web3 and play-to-earn games and blockchain gaming would dislike the idea of a company like Square Enix getting in on blockchain tech. I can't speak for every person that has an ugly ape as a profile pic, but Square Enix's goals here do not seem to be aligned with that of decentralization and creating a trustless environment. Rather, Square Enix's endgame here is to have their operating costs subsidized by users on a blockchain. Blockchain games involve the participation of players with a variety of motivations. They exercise their own agency in creating and running the world of the game. Going forward, we may see the concept of decentralized gaming take off in a proliferation of token economies, which are mechanisms for incentivizing players to take part in decentralized games in various ways. If this leads to the creation of self-sustaining worlds with even greater scalability, I believe we will see new types of games produced unlike any anyone has ever seen before. Matsuda is doing everything here except for using the word crowdfunding, which is already an area the industry has an underhanded history with. Tossing blockchain gaming and NFTs on top of that only introduces layers of unregulated complexity, crazy volatility, and lots of fancy technical jargon. And this isn't some galaxy brain take by me, this is a baked in feature of Web3. Matthew Dion, content consultant at Navic, a game business advisory firm that covers blockchain gaming, writes, Traditionally, games industry funding has come from three primary sources angel investors, venture capitalists, and strategic investors. However, the decentralized nature of Web3 has opened up a variety of new avenues for fundraising. The most prominent example of this has been the public sale of tokens, both fungible and non-fungible. Countless examples of this are happening every day on OpenSea, Twitter, and Discord, representing a broad spectrum of intent ranging from legitimate attempts to innovate and experiment to outright grifts and scams. This new approach to attracting investment has functioned as a sort of Web3 crowdfunding mechanism, similar to the Kickstarters or Indiegogos of Web2. It also relies on the same one-sided trust factor, the hope that the projects organizers will actually deliver a game after raising all that money. What's funny is that we've seen Web3 proponents argue that the audience for Web3 games won't be gamers under the classical definition. Instead, it'll be people interested in investing. 
also known as investors. Square Enix evidently doesn't view the issue the exact same way, and if we are to go by the words of its CEO, seems to be interested in bolting the two paradigms together, regardless of how poor the fit is. But to be clear, in a Web3 pay-to-earn NFT super-duper interoperable trustless ass-ugly ape world, Elden Ring can't exist. Half-Life 2 can't exist, Squad can't exist, at least not without foundational changes to game design. Under that regime, when incentives become speculation and true digital ownership, games must have some kind of speculative asset, and game design is then coerced to fit that dynamic. The best result of Square Enix's or any company's flirtation with blockchain gaming is abject failure. It's tough to end something like this because I want to end it on an all-encompassing, all-reaching statement on how problems like pervasive monetization can be solved, but problems like that are systemic and there isn't a single succinct solution. I do think it's helpful though to break things down to their base elements. FIFA's loot boxes are just a monetization tool. They have nothing to do with creativity or meaningful game design. Blockchain gaming is much the same way. It may be adjacent to a wider philosophy of decentralized and redistributed power, but large companies like Square Enix only see it as a mechanism for monetization. Much like Bruzo's embarrassing attempt to argue that loot boxes create realistic scarcity, the philosophy that ostensibly underlines blockchain tech is just a convenient shield. No one we talked about today personally instigated the industry's problems, but they have enabled them through over-monetization, through risk aversion, and through championing corporate propaganda. It's important we hold game executives and anyone in the industry in positions of power accountable not just for their actions, but their justifications. And this does happen today. Look no further than Yunpool's interview with Bruzo. But I also think it needs to happen more often and more thoroughly. Specifically, how that should be done is a conversation I think that goes beyond the scope of this video. But, as the saying goes, the price of good journalism is eternal vigilance. And the price to support us on Patreon is two, four, seven, and ten dollars and includes early access to videos and access to our Discord server and more. I told you I was having a tough time ending this video. I'm bad at calls to action, so I'm going to end it like this. See you next time.